So, all right, we're all live, everyone. Yay. I see everyone's here. I see you. It's good to be here. We've got a very European unplugged contingent this time, right, Ray? Yeah, that's the fun part. Yeah. Slowly we Jason, take you're over. Muted. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, you're muted. You're doing lots of hand waving, but we can't hear you. I was saying, let me start again, right? <laughs> It's easier to make predictions when you're that many hours ahead of the United States. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Is it a prediction or are they just the trendsetters at that point? Both. A little of both. Yeah. Like Forrest Gump says, I think it's a little of both. <laughs> um, so we have a few attendees on already, and just so everybody knows that they they they're not they haven't uh, accidentally listened in on us. That's the nature of unplugged. If you haven't seen one of our unplugged sessions, for the first 15 minutes we make small talk, coffee chat, water cooler chat, whatever you want to call it. So we're subject to say anything in the next little bit, and we'll get started with a more formal conversation in in uh, at 15 minutes after. So be glad you, and we are glad you joined us early. Excellent. Yeah, and just a reminder for anybody that's out there, um, this is a fully interactive session beyond just kind of seeing the behind the scenes and everything else there. If you have questions, comments for our panelists, uh, please direct them via the question and or chat window. We'll be monitoring that and um, try to get to everyone's questions and answers. And actually, if you have a question or want to be part of the, the dialogue, once you ask your question, I'll ask you, do you want to be unmuted from uh, on the session? And you can actually uh, be added to the audio stream and ask your questions live and interact with us a little bit and carry on the discussion. So that's one of the fun parts about this session. So uh, I highly encourage you guys to do that if, if you want. But in the meantime, it's good to see everybody. I see Johan's got his fire going in the background. That's nice. Definitely. It's it's almost Christmas time, right? So uh, yeah. and and uh, my my lab is actually next to me and generating a lot of heat. So I, I thought you know it it would to make total sense to have a, a fireplace at the back uh, to reflect the heat. Very smart. Go. Very so smart. I am very warm and cozy here. Excellent. So what have you got in your lab running at the moment then, Johan? What are you testing at the moment? Uh, a couple of things. So uh, you probably cannot really read it over there, but I'm uh, I'm currently <laughs> busy writing the sequel to my, my first book. So the, the sequel to the VDI design guide, which doesn't have a uh, real title yet, uh, but I'm, I'm uh, currently testing out some um, uh, some new use cases I'm uh, I'm going to write about and and um, so one of the things that I, I I talked about quite a lot in the last let's say two years is VDI bidet compute by night so GPU cycle repurposing basically um, and we have talked about it quite a while um, and not really showed it to the world so that's basically what I'm currently working on uh, kind of productizing that strategy that that vision. And um, being able to uh, share it in, uh, with the world and, and basically show it. So a big part of the book will be um, uh, will be describing um, the architecture, the, the caveats, the design considerations, stuff like that. So that's mainly what's what's running over here. A lot of GPUs generating oh. heat, making noise. <laughs> and, uh, cool. So when you right, get to the publish it, when's the publication date targeted for? Uh, June 2021. That's that's uh, what I'm uh, aiming for. But uh, you know how writing works, right? So it's it's it yeah. could be sooner, it could be later, it could be. Um, I I had a hard time um, uh, like making the cut of what was going to be in it and not going to be in the, in the in the previous book. Uh, because if, if I wanted to, I could probably, you know, ha have written a, a year longer with, with two, 300 pages more, but that's just, uh, it's, 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 it's done when it's done, right? Yeah. Sounds exciting. Great stuff. You looking for sponsors for that second book? <laughs> I might. And uh, I, my, my friends at Liquidware have to have to help me a lot with the with the previous book, and um, 
Um, I already mentioned them, by the way, in, in the in the next book as well. Um, and we we haven't talked about sponsorship or anything else because I, I um, what I what I describe basically in the book is how I um, like to use my favorite technologies. And I'm I'm not being paid by any company yet or or at all uh, to um, 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 because I I, I want to be independent and. Um, mm -hmm. I I strongly believe that if you have some favorite technologies that you that you really like a lot and and they give you uh, the proper outcome, uh, then I honestly don't think it 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 um, is a problem to to mention them in in a in a in a book like this. No, I I agree because I know Ruben, you guys over at Nutanix have got sort of like your own technology community haven't you and i think um community i think actually all of us on this call from the independent side are the experts and i i actually wondered how everyone thinks what 2021 is going to bring from a community perspective um so ruben what what are you guys up to for next year yeah well i'm not leading the like the nutanix um community no. like the ntc program but still like for me community is all about like Connecting with the right people, uh, sharing ideas, energize each other. Um, unfortunately, that's like all virtual right now. But still, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's good to have communities on on different sides and or building new communities and um, or sort of reigniting existing communities is also part of that. Uh, while Johan was uh, describing his book um, or his second book experience um, on the team RGE side, we're also Johan is also part of that. Um, like reigniting uh, writing skills and see what will happen uh, like next year. But in general, I, I I believe connecting with each other in tough times from different elements, but also from an like IT UC perspective, uh, it's important to connect with each other and stay connected. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's why I think communities are important right now, are important 10 years ago and like become more and more important um, like upcoming years as well yeah especially when especially when um sort of um unbiased voices like unbiased info and unbiased voice is, is super important mm -hmm. and i think the 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 vendors who are able to sort of harness that community where people are heard even when their feedback is not always at what they would like to see or hear that is super important to have that um like group where you are able to share whatever your thoughts are uh, and stay within that group even yeah, when that conflicts with the uh, with the sort of vendor who's organizing that uh, that event mm -hmm. and that's why i think like unplugged is a good example where um, yeah people can share and express their um, their opinion even yeah, when yeah opinion isn't, isn't the same isn't the same as the vendor um, like agrees on you bring yeah. up a good point because doing these things like you know the uh we do this we do the inside track the inside track is all all the influencers we can get into a room or a virtual room <laughs> and when we're jane when jane and i are adding people in i'm like yes 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 they're influencer influencer but they said something bad about it. okay well <laughs> it's like it hurts a little bit but they say things usually whoever they is that makes us better that makes the community better yes. it makes liquidware better so it's 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 good to have total involvement in there uh, even though it's a two-edged sword sometimes yeah. i must say that that this is a uh, a big a uh, compliment to uh, to you guys for organizing this year's um, uh, event as well, just prior to VMworld. I, I truly believe this was one of the best additions until so far. Although, you know, even even though it it was virtual, but uh, there was a, a great number of announcements and um, uh, it's really cool to see um, organizations like yourselves, but also IGEL, also Stratus, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Stratus, Stratus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to use the event actually to announce something, um, and and recognize that it's not just a another um, I don't know another uh, virtual event that you could use to, to present your marketing slides. No, it was actually used to present some some yeah, new announcements. That, that was really cool. When we conceived it, we said thanks. We, we were like, this has to be the inside track, or you can't participate as a as a another vendor. Um, 
you have to volunteer information that gives the influencers the inside track. And I realize, and I'll reiterate, we have several people on, on the line now. Some of them are in customers, some of them are in users. But who do you look to to get your news from? And we believe that's the influencer. And this, this is the bloggers and, and the new wave of media. They're the first to get information to market. And of course, there's the media and there's the analyst, and those make up the inside track. And it is, we keep it as a tight knit group because we want them in turn to go out and tell the world what's going on with this top list of vendors out there and we encourage the participation of other vendors but it's uh it's been a good event i believe since we got started and i believe johan you came on if not the first one of the very first there when we did that in vegas yeah at the uh charlie palmer restaurant didn't you yep with yeah. the steaks it's been good it's been a good event yeah. we've done them at every uh citrix energy and right in front of every vm world uh we missed this energy this year because there wasn't one but we did it in front of vm world we're getting close to the 15 minute after mark and i am so pleased to have with uh, on with us ray swanson on our team ray uh that's going to help us moderate things and, and keep things moving along we we're going to ask for questions to come in as we see them but also jane rimmer is in effect co-hosting this with us and we're going to go through introductions as we're about to get started more formally with today's topic uh, predictions for the coming year, if that's even possible, given the year we've had with an unpredictable 2020. I'm Jason E. Smith. I'm the Vice President of Mar uh, Product Marketing with Liquid Wear, and I usually co-host these things, but you're going to hear as much from Jane today. And Jane, you want to do an introduction of yourself. We'll join, we'll make our introductions in the order that we join today. So it'll be Jane, then Ruben, then Rory, and Johan. Hey, everyone. It's great to be on here today. Um, I'm kind of a hybrid, so I am working with Liquidware. I have been since they founded in 2009. I'm an independent marketing consultant, and I'm a V expert, and I've been in the community for as long as I can remember. In fact, I worked in virtualization before it was even formally called virtualization during my time at Citrix back in the, uh, the mid-90s. So great to be on here today and look forward to our discussions. Great, like I'm the Dutch guy together with Johan today. Um, yeah, I would say like a geek technologist, EUC, uh, passionate about EUC for a long time, uh, part of the Microsoft program for MVP program for a long time, um, spent almost a decade on the CTP program and the VXWIT program until I joined uh, Frame. Um, Frame got acquired by Nutanix and in that time frame also left uh, both programs. But still very passionate about EUC uh, and I think VDI, DAS, GPU uh, developments, like all kinds of stuff related. I'm, um, I have three kids, 20 year old, 18 year old and then 14 year old, which is uh, yeah, interesting, especially these days in 2020 and uh, yeah, working from home and uh, remote distance learning and so on. Let's see if we can talk about that later as well. Interesting topic to see how we can keep motivated while working from home with three kids uh, uh, and a nice wife around you. Indeed. R uh, we're glad you're with us, Ruben. Thanks for joining us. Rory? Uh, my name is Rory Monaghan. I've been working about the virtual desktops, virtual application space for close to 15 years. Uh, I'm currently not a consulting a consultant. I'm working uh, internally within an IT uh, for a chain of hospitals. So it's been a pretty interesting year. I'm working remotely from Ireland, from the west of Ireland. I have two kids, uh, one about to turn five, the other's about two. So I relate to what Ruben is saying and I am wearing noise canceling headphones. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be muted. So you guys might hear my kids, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Thanks Rory. Johan? Yeah, Johan van Amersfoort, uh, VMware fanboy. Uh, been working in and use computing since the late 90s exactly in october 99 so i always refer to that as the late 90s um in the beginning with uh winframe uh, later with uh, terminal services and um, um and i'm currently working for itq consultancy as a technologist in the field of end user computing and uh, artificial intelligence and uh i have a one-year-old and uh, the house today turned into um home office slash um daycare so um <laughs> she's seriously awesome uh 
Um, and the screen behind me that currently shows a, um, a fireplace uh, normally also shows uh, YouTube videos uh, with uh, preferably Kermit the Kicker, uh, Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Ray, do uh, you want to tell them the ground rules, reiterate? Sure. Um, so today, we our topic is looking at predictions for 2021. Uh, we invite all of you to go ahead and uh, share your thoughts, your questions, your comments with us. If you want to pose those in either the chat and or question window, uh, what we'll do is we'll ask if you want to be added to the discussion. If you want to, we will unmute you. You can ask your question yourself. Or if you prefer not to, you want to stay behind the curtain, that's fine. Uh, just let us know. We'll ask the question of the panelists and we'll go from there. Um, it, so this is really free flowing. There's not going to be, I don't know if there'll be any slides other than um, maybe this one slide that we'll show real quick here that will show us uh, some contact information and whatnot. So we'll put this up again towards the end, maybe a little bit, but um, this is just, really what it is. It's the conversation and, and moving through there. I know um, yesterday when we kind of all synced up to make sure our technology was working and everything, uh, some of the conversation started a little bit. And um, Jane, did you have any any points were, that you thought from that conversation that you wanted to kick us off? No, well, I just think from today's perspective, it's interesting that we've got people from vendors, we've got people from the channel, and we have Rory from an end user company perspective right now. So I think if Rory can kick off with some of his thoughts for 2021, um, because they were pretty interesting, I thought. So I'm sure our participants would like to understand from your perspective, Rory, what you see happening next year. Sure. Um, I think we covered a few different areas, but I guess more specifically to um, just like the day-to-day -day work and user computing, all that happened in this terrible <laughs> year for a lot of us. Um, you know, I work for a not-for-profit organization, and I'm sure a lot of people do too. Like that's a huge challenge in these times when, uh, you know, you have a certain pool of money just sitting there and that's all you can spend. I mean, you gotta keep generating money in order to spend money. Uh, so this year, budgets were slashed for 2020. For 2021, things aren't looking too rosy, but you know, just the way things have gone with the work from home surge, one area of increased spending is going to be end user computing. So I know that Johan had mentioned uh, previously before and something that I'm seeing is, we had a big rush to get thousands of remote workers enabled on like virtual desktops. And it was just kind of best effort at first. It was like, just get something out, a minimal viable product, let them work away. They can request whatever specialized apps they need that might not be there. And we'll just try to adjust it to their workflows as, as we go. And, and it was just kind of a best effort thing and building it little by little to increase the productivity um, as like the days, weeks, and months went on. Um, for 2021, like things are still a little uncertain, so you don't know how, what you're going to invest in other than maybe um, one or two key areas. Um, for beyond 2021, I think like the work from home is going to be a reality. We're going to have to adjust to this in the long term, and we're going to have to modernize things properly. So I think for 2021, it's going to kind of continue to be a best effort, patch the biggest holes that we currently have. But then beyond that, we've got to modernize uh, just application delivery, user profile management, um, the actual like end user experience on the desktops and just everything going forward, because I think work from home is here to stay. So Rory, on that point, do you see that perhaps beyond 2021, it's going to be more of a focus on apps and the actual desktop? Yeah, I, I wrote a blog, I think a couple of months ago now, where I was suggesting that. So what I've actually experienced is a lot of our um, users have had access to just published applications for years and years. Like before any desktops were available, they already had published applications. but there was maybe um, limited use cases. It was people who were on call who might need to get like in remotely 
to check something um, for patients, care, or whatever. Um, but it wasn't like a primary driver, what they're using all day, every day. But as people went to work from home, there were a lot of people who were already familiar with using their applications, their published applications when remote. So they just opted to do that because the apps that they needed were there. They could just run them on their Mac or on their personal PC. And they're using their own PC that they, they know and they like with the applications they need. And that worked for um, a lot of people. Now, there are some people who are maybe relying on some outdated technologies like map network drives, and they need file level access where a full virtual desktop was the, the solution for them. But I'm seeing more um, vendors embracing things like SharePoint Online and um, cloud storage services for integrating with the applications. Frame, perfect example, integrating those uh, different cloud storage solutions. So I think that's going to be the future that applications are going to be writ uh, written in a way that they can write data to these cloud storage solutions. So there'll be less dependency on a full desktop and backend file storage. So that should enable things like Citrix Workspaces, Workspace ONE um, to be just a primary driver for launching your applications and keeping your own nice little Mac that you know and love and just using what you need. Right. So I guess, Johan, obviously working at ITQ as a technologist, you're seeing lots of those different types of vendors and technology. How are you seeing the requirements from your customers to actually implement these like in the current environment and what do you see happening in the future? Well, um, it's it's uh, like Rory mentioned, we, we're seeing that uh, the, 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 the end user um, kind of demands or, or probably due to the fact that uh, that a company doesn't have enough endpoints to ship around, everyone just basically uses what they can, right? And mm -hmm. um, IT, for IT, it's really important to stay in control over what happens in the organization, both from a uh, just plain management perspective, so enrollment of a device or uh, installing of applications, but um, I would say mostly because of security because data and applications inside the company premises need to stay inside the company premises. And you don't want to, uh, you, sure, you want to, uh, you know, provide access to an application or to data from a personal device, but still um, remain in control or stay in control over what happens. And um, uh, this is why I strongly believe that organizations should focus on security um, as well, or, or, or have a big focus on security and um, the whole zero trust strategy that or, or vision that that Google created with the, their Beyond Corp um, um, virtual organization is is something that I believe that companies should should, should definitely look uh, at because it's not. Um, it, it, it's you know if if organizations for instance implement secure wi-fi networks inside their company premises is it still secure if if i uh, you know if i if i have a device and and, and, and sign in um, uh, over that wi-fi network it's it's still possible for me to show what's happening on a display to someone that's that's not uh, allowed to see it or uh, to print something that might not be uh, allowed to be printable so I strongly believe if if you should focus on like a zero trust strategy and act or treat everything to be insecure without losing a great user experience, that is something that organizations should focus on. And I think mm -hmm. vendors like VMware, like Citrix, uh, as well as Nutanix are focusing on bringing that rich user experience to the end user without losing um, uh, uh, losing on security. And st still remain that secure environment. I guess there's there's always that layer eight. Humans are inherently insecure, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, and it's and you know, there's so, always someone who clicks on something, right? Yeah. And that's it. You, you don't want to uh, focus on on um, uh, blocking everything. You want to focus on avoiding misuse. Correct. Ruben, yeah, what you are don't want to frustrate users. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I walked on the conversation, Ruben. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the trouble with the. Oh, no worries, I didn't, I didn't hear a question. Sorry about that. No, I was just saying, Ruben, what are your thoughts on, on what we've been discussing so far? Yeah, for me, 2020 was exciting. Sometimes people want to want to leave the C out of exciting, so exiting. Uh, 2020 exit <laughs> next. <laughs> but, uh, but both both are, are are correct. Both are true. Like um, yeah, like it's from an EUC perspective, it, it's really exciting what is what happened. Like digital transformation, when we normally talk years and years about it, digital transformation just happened in weeks. <laughs> Something like like that. Uh, the adoption of like Zoom and Teams. When you look at my kids here at ho at home. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, they need to be at home. Uh, we are back in lockdown in Netherlands uh, as of today. But when you look at the technology side, and EUC is a l large umbrella term, which includes unified communication, which includes VDI, DAS, virtual app and desktop, includes like the security elements uh, Johan mentioned. So it's great to be part of the EUC space. It always was great, and uh, in 2020 is great, and 2021 plus plus, uh, next com coming years, also will be great. So yeah, it is exciting uh, technology. Uh, why? Because it's close to you, me, my kids, to us. And that's, yes, it's no longer that's difficult like to exciting. have my kids say what their father does for a living. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, he Something does that. Good. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think Bobby mentioned that. Like uh, I, I also saw a huge uh, uptake, especially in the uh, like beginning of this year. Um, a lot of uh, people bought new cloud VDI, head DAS. That's what I see because that's one of the, yeah. my main focus. But also, like uh, when you already have VDI, uh, virtual apps, and desktop in place, like Rory mentioned, okay, how can I add more resources to that to the platform to support more users, sort of instant when they need to work from home? Right. And that's what I think uh, Jane, you mentioned that like that's not going to change. In that's not going to change. People know what the benefits are. From working from home, they also know and, and probably see on a daily basis what the downsides are mentally, just physically, from working from home. So somewhere in time, I'm not sure what what time will be, but then we'll sort of balance and see that it's good to be in the office, for instance, two days a week or three well, days a week, if the, if if work permits, right? And um, yeah, I think that will happen in, in the future, near future. Ruben, uh, I'm I'm interested uh, in in uh, getting your feedback on something that we've seen at Liquidware. Uh, with the adoption of these projects, you know, in, in March, we re we received calls within week within the week of when a lot of people sent people to work from home in mid-March. And right. one thing that started to stand out, though, was that these projects had to move forward, but all of a sudden, ROI, and this goes back to something Rory said about spend your spend, ROI became so important in in the spring. If you're going to spend a dollar, it better help our company move forward in these tough times uh, and organization move forward in these tough times. So there was a there was a project that we I got involved with personally uh, for one of our customers early on, and we went through a whole ROI study for them, and I immediately saw that this could apply to more and more organizations. So we put more effort behind and refreshing our ROI materials in the past how we can save an organization money through uh, the extension of of, uh, of even hardware, getting another year out of it through optimizing what they have through with, with Stratosphere, um, for making users more productive, cutting user login times from minutes down to seconds, having the user not have to recreate things. So we've got a we've got an ROI uh, calculator that we've beefed up. We have on our website, but all of a sudden it rang true. It was like every other week I had a major enterprise asking. Uh, they were interested in our solutions, but they were interested in how they could also save the money or they were going to get nowhere with them. And I know, Ruben, you guys have Steve Kaplan over there at, at Nutanix, who's been a leader in this industry and in looking at ROI. But did you guys see the same thing in, to, in 2020? And do you think it's going to also continue ahead that, that ROI is more important than ever? <laughs> the, the, the start, we didn't. I, I didn't see that because people were sort of in semi panic mode okay how can i like uh support my colleagues and okay let's just uh invest and we'll do the calculation a little bit later and then uh, like reality sink, uh, did sink in and people thought well okay if this is sort of a permanent or like like for a large group permanent solution what is sort of cost efficient so in the beginning it was mostly okay hey let's expand the existing base uh, or go to, and or use public cloud 
and worry about cost a little bit later. Um, and now a little bit later is happening. So yes, like the ROI TCL calculations are happening big time. And also, I also see customers moving from public cloud first to sort of what I call uh, like cloud smart because they see the benefits of public cloud and there are huge benefits of public cloud on, on different sites. But also the challenges from that, from a cost like ROI TCL calculation, from an, um, just resource cap uh, capabilities and resource ca uh, like capacity perspective and scratch their head. Okay, if this is like the sort of um, permanent scenario, why I am running X, Y, Z in public cloud? Why should I run certain elements back online to be more cost efficient or to be to have better hype, to be, to have better performance? But that's that didn't happen in the earlier days of um, of pandemic, um, but ha is happening now and will happen for sure in 2021 and uh, moving forward. All right. So I got I got a a question for you guys. And um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, well, let's say in March, um, we were in the middle of two major, um, like really big EUC projects, uh, a hospital and a, and a really big uh, uh, municipality. And um, halfway through, so we were halfway to migration, which means that half of the use cases were already migrated on the platform, but the other half was still, um, uh, um, in plan because not all of their applications were uh, were on the new platform yet. Still, because of the necessity for them to work remotely, they all accepted the fact that, let's say the top 25 of applications were on the platform, the other applications weren't accessible, but still they could do ma the, their main work. I would say, I, I would uh, like Rory, you work with, with customers on a, or with end users on a daily basis. Do you think the acceptance level of, a, of, of an end user or of a persona has changed due to the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I think it has. Well, I think initially there was a lot of frustration because people were expecting to be able to work the exact same way they did in the office. So initially there was like a flood of like calls, complaints, but as people kind of reset their expectations, and there's just been some sort of acceptance. And kind of as you were, were mentioning, you, know, you had these uh, projects online around March where I was working. It was really bad timing because we were switching our MFA. So as people were going to work from home, we also had to onboard them into the new MFA solution. So there was a lot of frustration at that, a lot of calls related to that. And it was just really bad timing. And there was also, the state um, that I'm working for, uh, they closed the schools before um, giving a mandate for companies to move people to work from home. So just de facto, a lot of people had to go work from home because their kids were going to be at home. So our expectation of when the surge was going to happen ended up to be wrong because there was a surge earlier due to the schools closing. So yeah, I'd say March, April, May, and even into a little bit of June was just hectic. And it was also hectic for the end users. They were just dealing with the frustrations of adapting to their home work environments. I think we probably all saw like all the tweets and pictures of people working from their dining room table, no ergon ergonomic chairs or anything like that. So that frustration pinned up and then not being able to be as productive because they're missing applications mm -hmm. created this perfect storm of frustration from end users, but they have kind of reset their expectations and um, things are a little more stable now. You, you mentioned MFA and I had to Google it, but then I was like, okay, it must be <laughs> multi-factor authentication, right? Um, yeah. So, um, but I'm not an IT guy, so uh, not at heart, <laughs> uh, but we went through that too at Liquidware and it was, a lot of it was driven by well, it's increasingly, you know, our customer base is asking us to make sure we have MFA in place and also office driving that. So uh, you, you guys, is that, is that what was the, what was the driver behind it? Was it, was it Office 365 or was it internal systems or, because we're seeing that internally and I believe that's a trend going forward too in 2021 that a lot of organizations are still implementing MFA, jump on the bus term there. Yeah, and I, I think a lot are moving to Microsoft MFA just because of the way they've approached things. You know, most enterprise customers are using Windows operating systems, they're using Office. You know, they're going to start consuming more Azure re, um, services. So 
it's kind of a de facto choice to then use the Microsoft MFA. So people are on other forms of MFA, maybe like RSA, they've got the, the key fobs or the app on their phone. And then now they're going to cut over to this Microsoft MFA, which that's also a bit of a, uh, an adaption for people who are maybe not uh, primarily in technical roles, but they have to interact with technology because we all do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it's not necessarily just Office that's um, steering it. It's kind of like Microsoft and the fact that you're consuming a lot of Microsoft products and their offering is kind of mm -hmm. making the MFA, their MFA a choice or yeah. a sensible choice. So you're replacing it for all yeah, the different services. I, I am a tech, not an IT guy at heart, right? Uh, historically, but I am a tech guy. and. Um... I was frustrated when we rolled it out. I was like, this authenticator app, and where do I go over there, and how do I come back over here and get a key and generate a key and stuff like that? I found out I could um, use an alternative method, my cell phone still, authenticate with a different method, and it would just send the code to my cell phone, which I found far easier than the authenticator app and all that. And now I, I get away from it a bit, but I know even some of our SEs internally say, you can't do that anymore. And I said, yeah, there's a little hidden, there's a little hidden button right here. It says authenticate with a different method and it sends a code to your, your cell phone. And that's, yeah, that's another, I think that's another thing too, is that a lot of these um, cloud services, they're upgrading um, so aggressively, like Microsoft MFA, for example, I noticed on the Android app, you know, you get the push notification, you'd accept it and everything was golden. Mm -hmm. Well, now they've added another layer of security where you have to put in your um, your app's pin code or else use the biometric as yeah. another layer of security, yeah. which, you know, for non-technical people, it's like, oh, my MFA is not working. So we all have to also adjust to this new aggressive um, release cycle and update cadence from these cloud products too. Yeah, you guys know more than me. Did you have to make? Did everybody have to make the jump that had Office 365 this year because of something off they pushed, or is this a trend going forward in 2021 that more organizations will continue to be forced to adopt MFA? Did it already happen, or is it in the process of happening? Is that a trend going forward in 2021? Well, well it's honestly, been. go ahead. Uh, everyone else, go ahead. <laughs> I honestly think that MFA, uh, you know, MFA by itself only says something about an extra form of authentication, but um, using the right form of authentication and the, and, and the most, I won't say the most secure one, but the most, um, uh, the one that, that offers the best user experience is definitely going to be key here. I don't want to be bothered with MFA uh, options when I'm uh, inside a company premises, but like I mentioned just just uh, uh, um, earlier, if you are implementing zero trust within your company premises, you basically act every location to be unsecure, and thus it might make sense to um, to use uh, uh, some form of MFA. But honestly, I don't want to be bothered with like a, a push notification or a, a text message being sent to my device. I just want to, for instance, I have a MacBook here. With a uh, uh, with a fingerprint reader, why not use that fingerprint reader for an additional factor uh, while you're at it? That that yeah. or or the camera in a, in a, in a in a Windows laptop like with Windows Hello, that makes more sense, right? It's a lot. So if a bank can use that, why can't uh, can't we? In IT, and that's 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 why 2021 and also 2020 uh, is and was exciting. Because this, like this part, of, not about MFA per se, but it's more about like modern identity providers, where MFA is like connected to that to make sure that like with two-factor authentication, people have access to the right resources. That's modern IDP, so not classic Active Directory, but Azure AD or Okta or Ping or um, like VMware Identity Manager are all in the same bucket, modern IDP, and that is super important in an, uh, in in EUC because many people have different doors or different front doors to access their app. That could be a full desktop, that could be a published app. Maybe it is, maybe you use Teams and connect Teams to act to launch apps, or maybe you have Horizon 1 um, or VMware, uh, VMware Horizon uh, as the access layer. So there are different uh, ways to access apps and the sort of 
uh, entry level, the key to access that and to unlock and open the right door is the modern IDP with MFA or, or not, but mostly MFA uh, in different formats is what I, what I see happening. I think one of the things, Ruben, that you hit on earlier when we were chatting was you were talking about how do how do companies keep their employees motivated to be working from home? You know, we've all just been discussing around how people are frustrated as, you know, the user experience is the same as it was before. Do you think the onus is on companies to keep their employees motivated? I'm not talking specifically around technology, but just that whole sort of mental health awareness of working from home and what the impact is. What, what do you think companies need to do? Yeah, it starts with acknowledging that it's it's a real risk and also for people, colleagues, um, a real and serious issue as well. So acknowledging that is the starting point. Um, and then like connecting with people, although you still cannot connect physically, but connecting with people and to check in how they are doing and read between the lines, uh, especially when it's like a co-worker or if you're a manager, it's your direct colleague, you can sense or often you can sense how they are doing. And then you need to react on that. Um, like, like for instance, like organize um, like every quarter, a couple of days off, like paid a day off, or making sure that the uh, work environment is well as good or as great as it can be. Um, but also, if people are not used to work from home, like I'm work, I'm used to work from home, so I have my own sort of routine, my own tricks, my own things to work from home, which help me. Uh, but there are also colleagues where work from home is a new thing or an, like permanent work from home is a new thing. And then just help them with uh, sharing uh, like my tips or someone else's tips and help them to, yeah, help them with sharing this, these tips to, uh, yeah, to keep them healthy and happy uh, on, on different levels. That's, that's what I do. And um, yeah, that's, that I doesn't mean that, that these are all the ingredients and guarantee that will help. Um, I know like, colleagues, um, peers in the community who really struggle with uh, like mental health issues uh, right now. And um, yeah, I think Christian Riley mentioned that earlier, like it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. And it starts with communication, like, hey, hey I, I don't feel well. And that's the starting point. And then make sure that you have colleagues, peers, friends, uh, spouses, where you can connect with and make sure that, um, yeah, you speak about these issues. And I before think they also, get, before you know, they get a real issue as well, like a real, real issue. Absolutely. And I think technology plays a part, certainly in terms of like with Stratosphere UX, providing that visibility for the help desk to help the users to ensure that they've still got their user experience, at least on par, if not hopefully better than in a work from home or a re remote work environment. But there's also the the other side of the coin in terms of, well, how much are you looking at me from a productivity point of view? You know, we we're talking about zero trust earlier, but we've got to also let our Full employees trust. Full know trust employee. yes, yeah. that we trust them to work from home. And I've seen people being way more productive working from home than they do in the office because there's no water cooler chats, there's no going off to the kitchen to get a quick cup of coffee. So. I think there's upsides to everything, right? But there's, as you say, there's downsides too. We need to be aware right. of those. Ray, uh, Ray, you see a question there? I do. Um, so a question came in and someone asked, uh, even large companies now have overloaded VPN. For those that are moving to Azure, how uh, are work from home employees most likely to connect to corporate desktops in Azure? Someone wanna, um, yeah, I see, I see Ruben uh, nodding his head, yeah. so you wanna take that? Sure, um, like there, there are two elements. So there are one element is where are the workload machines running? Yeah, because this, like the, the question was around Azure, I assume in Azure, but sometimes assumption is the mother of all uh, apps, uh, 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 someone said. So like understand where are the workload machines and also where is the data? And the best application and user experience is when app and data are close to each other. So one of the mistakes I often see is, okay, okay, let's go everything to public cloud. Let's run all the apps in public cloud. And then, okay, but well, uh, great to have these apps or these virtual apps and desktops in Azure, but where's my data? Oh yeah, that's, that's like in the data center. Let's set up a side-to-side -side VPN connection. 
and then shit hits the fan. So these elements are key elements to design or maybe redesign a virtual app and desktop environment. But imagine you, both app and data are running in public cloud, then it makes sense to use like uh, a sort of direct connection from the endpoint, from the user perspective to connect to, to public cloud and not through the company network per se. Now the security people, networking people might say, well, that's not secure. Well, it depends how you set up that network set, uh, environment, right? If you use like SSL VPN uh, like uh, type scenarios or like uh, streaming gateway, secure gateway scenarios to connect securely from the endpoint to Azure uh, uh, network, then you can still leverage your uh, local from endpoint perspective, uh, like outbreak and uh, internet outbreak to Azure directly. And that's that's what I see a lot. But keep in mind, where's the app running? Where are the workload machines? And the second question is, where is the data? Make sure that these two are well connected to each other. Yeah, I will add that um, on the topic of VPN, I, I had a little smile because uh, <laughs> it's one of the biggest topics that came up particularly early on was people uh, contacting me because they're having such bad performance problems with VPN. It's just like they would send business analysts home and get them to work over VPN and just completely saturate and take down the network uh, running these huge uh, data computations over VPN that just didn't make sense. Um, kind of further to what Ruben was saying, yeah, I think the apps kind of drive it and the workflow kind of drives it. So I saw someone who was working pretty high up in a vendor that does like remote access technologies, uh, kind of decrying VPN is like, oh, it's so outdated, so silly. You need to move away from VPN. Then I saw someone else who works for a large vendor who does a little bit of remote access, but does a lot of other stuff too saying that they've got remote employees who are using VPN. Um, I know just from speaking to others that there's just these certain workflows that are still relying on VPN for one reason or another. So it's a reality that that's gonna be kept. I've seen some using remote PC, are there technologies like go to PC to get back to a physical workstation in the office where, well now that work from home seems to be um, kind of dragging out and becoming permanent people might want to move away from having a physical machine dedicated. They want to move to a virtual machine, either hosts are running in a data center or preferably, I guess, in the cloud. Yeah. I, I wrote down uh, for another event there, like 2020 was the year of VPN. Uh, blah. The year of Zoom on Teams, meh. And the year of VDI in DAS, hooray. So, All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, Ray, just, he just said it. He just exactly. said it. 2020 yeah, was the year of VDI. It was. Oh, I said, uh, VDI and DAS, I said to you on. All right. Yeah. yeah, but DAS is just basically VDI in someone else's data center. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> the cloud. That's a good debate. Ray, <laughs> Ray, you see another question? <clears throat> yeah, sure. There was a question about the, uh, and I know we touched a little bit about, um, you know, security and whatnot. And um, someone had asked about what, is the importance of trust in the tools that they're using today um you know i think they they talked about uh exposures from unpatched software and uh getting close to attacks and whatnot so how do you guys see the they mentioned solar winds i think right i think i saw yeah and the god god level access which sounds scary doesn't it this week um yeah. straight out of hackers I've seen that in the news you can you know, look at that you know, SolarWinds, and I'm not going to speak for them. They're actually a, an alliance partner of ours, but um, but uh, not one of our closest ones. But uh, they've undoubtedly helped many, many thousands of companies with the solutions they provide the market over time. And, and um, you know, we're in the business too. Stratosphere is on every desktop, and it helps you by uh, monitoring the user experience and everything. We, I can speak for you know our procedures. We go through background checks of our developers. We we actually develop everything onshore, uh, and we have very tight security in our builds and multi-factor authentication along the way, every, everywhere to check code in and out. And um, so we go through these these steps, and you know. Unfortunately, in the industry, industry-wide things like this with Citrix, this has happened to Citrix, right? Where they had an exploit and they're shipping something with an exploit within the Citrix products within the last year. So 
I, you know, I, I equate it to healthcare and their motto of, uh, and, and their commitment to do no harm, right? That's our intention. And the benefit of technology far, far outweighs uh, the slight risk that we see in, in cases. And, and thank, thank, uh, thank God, God level excess, thank God truly, not to make fun, that it was uh, found as soon as it was. And so we're going to do something about it. But um, I would say don't cut off your nose to spite your face. You know, trust in the vendor that you've made a decision based on their track record in the industry and make sure that they have things in place. We get requests for information all the time before we get quoted on our security measures. And that's some of the reasons why we're having to do the MFA in the last year internally and, and a lot of the things that we've put in place so we can be trusted. Uh, so my, rec my recommendation is to look at the industry standard um, benchmarks that are put place to ask from your vendor, uh, basic questions and, and, and advanced questions to make sure that those are in place. And obviously, I think DOD was mentioned in that question, if you're in a, in a more sensitive spot, you have far more to go through and to, to quiz your vendor and make sure that they, you have a great confidence in them and that's all you can do. Anybody else want to add to that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, sure you need to trust the vendor, and and you make a decision, a proper decision, uh, to to choose a certain vendor. But uh, you definitely need to look at your own IT environment and make sure that everything is up to date, um, upgrade to the to the latest patch levels, uh, because and, and Rory, I I guess you like every couple of weeks on the Five Bytes podcast, you you mention another exploit that was that was um released or or found and um and quite often it's based on older versions of software and and it organizations um you know quite often they don't they just choose not to update uh, uh you know to, to wait every every couple of months to uh, uh to create a new uh, maintenance window update everything that's not how it works anymore we need to stay up to date to to uh, uh, to be secure to keep uh, track of the CVEs. Um, you know, you, you, I, IT is not just about upgrading or updating software anymore. It's it's about staying in control and staying secure, and, and updating is part of that process. Yeah, yeah I, think, I, agree. I think it's interesting, actually, Johan, that. Um, when we were first talking about putting this unplugged session together, and it was just looking at. What do I think some of the, the 2021 predictions will be? And one of the things that I wrote down was that legacy apps will continue to be an IT admin's nightmare. <laughs> 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 what do we do? I mean, there's still so many out there. What do we do about them? And it's something that, you know, I mean, particularly say from Rory's point of view, that unless you've got super duper new budgets that you can just rewrite everything, they're going to be there for a long, long time. Well, and, and take uh, modern financial companies like big banks. They still use AS400s. Oh, they're the for, worst. For the main they're the worst they're main, main People yeah. who focus on AS400 prob probably get like a, a crap load of money every month just, just to maintain that. If you yeah. want to, seriously, if you want to push your career, start focusing on AS400 because you're, you'll you make a real, real shit like ton quick, of money. Quick, find, find some retired guy to learn it from, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, final yeah, predictions. What I find uh, frightening, frightening is that like, if these, um, like, these type of companies um, can be hacked and implement, impact, uh, like, uh, impacting large US, US government agencies, then everyone can be hacked just a matter of like uh, time and money if there is a nation state who is interested in itq mm -hmm. or a healthcare organization or nutanix or like pick a, pick a company right then yeah if you're on their radar then you're in trouble um the key the key then is okay how to make sure that the impact so the blast radius is uh, like as small as possible um so like internal red blue team testing external testing uh, indeed, screening of right people, um, role-based access control, patching, 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 like, uh, and also like internal awareness. So training is all like all these elements combined. Um, yeah, to make sure that 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 the sort of attack service becomes smaller, or that uh, it's tougher to uh, be hacked, so that the other organization who's hacking is maybe okay. This is too compli complicated. Okay, let's find someone else. And 
yeah, that's, so that's Rob, what I see. Ruben, do you think it's more about minimizing risk rather than mm -hmm. mitigating risk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we try to do both, yeah. but uh, yeah, if you're if you're on the radar of um, yeah, pick a random like large country with a lot of money, a lot of resources, and just willing to get insights, then yeah, it's not easy to uh, sort of uh, get rid of that. So I guess we've got like three minutes before the, the top of the hour and I think um, maybe I could summarise that both Ruben and Johan think that 2021 is the year of VDI and Daz. Rory, <laughs> what are your thoughts briefly on 2021 in summary? Uh, yeah, I certainly think that it's going to be a year of VDI and Daz for sure. Um, I think we also talked about security and that's zero trust. That's going to be a big player, particularly in certain industries where they're already very security focused. Like these mainstream stories, we already talked about the, the Citrix vulnerability. Can you believe that was this year? Like that was yeah. this year. Um, but there's been so many high profile ones that that's, it's going to be becoming an even more pressing matter to invest in security, but also training your users. Simple thing, we talked about MFA. Don't put the MFA app on the same machine that you're using for accessing your um, like your corporate resources. It's just this continuous training, um, just even from a personal standpoint, even your workers take them out of the work environment to protect themselves as well, because if they get hacked in their personal stuff with like spraying techniques, they might be reusing a password and you don't realize it within your organization. So and enable your users to protect themselves. Just security is going to be a big one. Uh, remote work is going to continue. Um, I think in, initially it's going to be a case of just fine tuning what you have um, and in the future modernizing what you have. And I think for all of our listeners and for people that are going to listen hopefully to the recording of this too, that if they couldn't attend live, Rory has a great um, Five Bytes podcast that is always, <laughs> and Johan, it's his favourite, one of his favourites, um, but also Johan has a great blog um, on thehojan.nl. So these guys have got a lot of experience that they can share with you all. So make sure that you check them out okay. as well. I right. think that uh, Thanks, I think I think if I had a final prediction, it would be that uh, 2021 is going to be the year of a second look. There was a lot of rush decisions made, and those are working out for many organizations. I did, you know, I, I spun up another thousand desktops in the cloud. Um, I did this, I did that, that got us through. But oh my gosh, it's here to stay. Are we doing this the best way? And to couple yep. that together with the ROI stuff, that's when people are really going to look at it or, you know, show me the ROI we're getting out of this before we commit to something even better than we cooked up to get us through 2020. And um, so the year of the second look is what I think. Cloud, cloud, from everything. cloud first to cloud smart, that's what I call it. That's exactly what you described. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is a great summary of that. <laughs> David on the on the line chimed in. He said that uh, his prediction is that Windows desktops aren't going away, uh, and he also added in that Liquidware is the best. So we thank you for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, that. Bass once, yeah, Sean Bass Thanks, once David. mentioned uh, during I, I think Bright Forum in London. I think it was uh, that. Um, so t take a, a nuclear war or a nuclear holocaust. So after the nuclear holocaust, three things will still remain: cockroaches. Twinkies, which are like really chemical sweet candy <laughs> thingies, and in traditional Windows apps. Thank I believe you. it. I believe it. <laughs> well, Excellent. I'd like to thank Jane for co-hosting this one with me. Ray, thank you as always for making sure that we have this pulled together with great organization and uh, and and everything you do. Ruben, Rory, Johan, thanks for being on the panel. Jane, any final words? No, I just hope that everybody has a wonderful Christmas, happy holidays, and a successful and safe, healthy 2021. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks. 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 Stay safe. Thank you. Bye, Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.